Perfect slow down, Mike, go ahead up. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Well, the weather was supposed to stop, but uh, thank you for coming out. And welcome to our 150th anniversary of Memorial Day, which began as Decoration Day in 1868. I ask at this time if you are able to stand. The Reading Police Department Honor Guard will present the colors. And the national anthem will be performed by the Reading High School Memorial Band.
Please remain standing for the invocation by Father Darren Colarusso, United States Air Force in St. Athanasius Parish. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, with a sober heart, we come before you this Memorial Day. We pause for a moment and call to mind all those who died in the service of our nation since its founding. Look with mercy on our brave and selfless brothers and sisters who did not shirk from their task, but gave themselves completely to the cause of defending and protecting us all. Bless all those who have given their lives for the sake of liberty and grant them eternal rest with you. Particularly strengthen and console our Gold Star families who share in their sacrifice. We remember also our brave men and women now serving in our armed forces, especially our loved ones and those from our town of Reading who serve both at home and abroad. Dear God, send out your angels to protect them all. Help them discharge their duties honorably and well. Bring them home safely to their families and loved ones. O oh Lord, bring your peace and mercy to our troubled world. Banish violence from our midst and wipe away our tears, that we all, deserve, we all may deserve to be called your sons and daughters. We ask this in your all holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Colarusso. I'm Kevin Bowmiller, and I'm very privileged to be Reading's Veteran, Ser Veteran Services Officer. And again, thank you all for being here today. 2018 marks 150 years of honoring the sacrifices of, American, of America's veterans. However, sacrifice is meaningless without remembrance. By honoring the nation's war dead, we preserve their memory. If you've never walked our four cemeteries in town, I encourage you to do so. Look at the markers and think of some of the places these men and women have been. Pearl Harbor, Normandy, Heartbreak Ridge, Chosin Reservoir, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Persian Gulf, Afghanistan, or Iraq. Remembering these places and fallen comrades, we must never forget the sacrifices made. On this 150th anniversary of Memorial Day, please take time to, to pay respect to all those living and deceased who served our country, because we must never, ever forget. And I welcome Senator, State Senator Jason Lewis, who is always very, very supportive of all things veterans. Senator Lewis, we're very honored to have you with us today. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you for your service as our veteran service officer here in the town of Red Reading. Um, good, uh, good morning, everyone. It is an honor to join with you today as we pay tribute to our nation's fallen heroes. I would like to take a moment and acknowledge those who are with us this morning who have lost a loved one in service to our country. It doesn't matter how much time has passed, we know that your grief is always with you. As President Woodrow Wilson said of the American flag, the lines of red are lines of blood, nobly and unselfishly shed by men who love the liberty of their fellow men more than they love their own lives and fortunes. More than one million of our fellow Americans have lost their lives fighting in wars to defend our freedom since the American Revolution. One of the most important ways that we can honor their sacrifice is by cherishing our veterans and their families. We should be proud that Massachusetts leads the nation in the level of supports and services that we provide to our veterans. For example, we stand alone in having veteran service offices, like Kevin, in every community in our Commonwealth. I'm very pleased that the state legislature recently passed the BRAVE Act, which I expect will soon be signed into law by Governor Baker. This important legislation expands recognition 
for our Gold Star families. It increases the length of paid military leave for those who are called to duty for training purposes. It increases the burial benefit for indigent veterans to adequately ensure a dignified funeral. And it expands eligibility for property tax exemptions to help ease the cost of housing for our veterans. As President John F. Kennedy, a Navy veteran of World War II and a Purple Heart recipient, once said, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Lewis. 150 years ago, retired Union General John Logan organized the first National Decoration Day to honor the fallen after the Civil War. This has become our Memorial Day. I'd now like to invite Mason Haynes from the Reading Memorial High School to read General Logan's Memorial Day orders. The 30th, the 30th day, of day of May, 1868, is de designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion, and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land. In this observance, no form or ceremony is prescribed, but posts and comrades will in their own way arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. We are, we are organized, organized comrades, as our, as our regulations tell us, tell us for the purpose, purpose among, among other things, of pre preserving and strengthening those kind and fraternal feelings which have bound together the soldiers, sailors, and Marines, and Marines united, united to suppress the late rebellion. rebellion. What, can what can aid more to assure this result than by cherishing tenderly the memory of our heroic dead, dead who, made who made their, their best breasts a barricade, a barricade between, between our country and its foe? Their soldier lives were the Revelly of freedom to a race in chains and, and a death, death a tattoo of, of rebellious, rebellious tyranny in arms. We should, we should guard, guard their graves with sacred vigilance. vigilance. All, that All that the consecrated, that the consecrated wealth and taste, taste of the nation can add to their adornment, adornment and security is but a, is but a fitting, fitting tribute, tribute, tribute to the memory of her slain defenders. defenders. Let, no Let no wanton foot tread rudely on such hallowed grounds. Let pleasant paths invite the coming and going of reverent visitors and found mourners. Let no, Let no vandalism, vandalism of avarice, of, avarice, of neglect, of neglect no, ravages no ravages of time testify to the present or to the, or to the coming generations that we have forgotten, as a people, the cost of free and undivided republic. republic. If, if other eyes, eyes grow dull and other hands slack, and other hearts cold in the solemn trust, trust ours shall keep it well as long as the light and warm of life remain in us. Let us, Let us, then, at the, at the time appointed, appointed gather, gather around their sacred remains and garland the passionless mounds above them with choicest flowers of springtime. Let us raise above them the dear old flag they saved from dishonor. And let us, in this solemn presence, renew our pledges to aid and assist those whom they have left among us as sacred charges upon the nation's gratitude. The soldiers and sailors, widow and orphan. Thank, you, Thank Mason. you, Mason. The high school, the high school band, band will now perform America, America the Beautiful. The Beautiful. I'd now like to introduce Mr. Barry Berman, Chairman, Reading Select Board, for a Memorial Day Address. Good morning, distinguished guests, friends, and neighbors. In Flanders fields the poppies blow, 
between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place and in the sky, the lark still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amidst the guns below. Thus opens the first stanza of Canadian poet and army surgeon Dr. John McRae's seminal poem about the killing fields of Belgium during World War I, although in those days it was called the Great War or the German War. We hadn't numbered our wars yet. We're approaching the 100th anniversary of the end of that great conflict, the war that was supposed to end all wars. Reading contributed its fair share of men and women to that great cause. With a population then of just under 7,000, over 400 men and women served overseas and 14 gave their lives. The town erected a memorial in 1939 to honor them. You passed it as you walked in. Today I want to tell you about one of those remarkable men of Reading, Ernest Leach. Most of what I'm going to tell you today was taken from snippets from the Reading Chronicle. It was provided to me by our town historian Virginia Adams, who we all owe a great de a debt of gratitude, keeping the history of Reading alive. In those days, the Chronicle regularly published letters home from soldiers and nurses stationed abroad. The letters would say, somewhere in France. It gave us an inside look at the war and the impact it had on the soldiers and nurses. Ernest Leach graduated high school in Reading and then worked as a teller at the First National Bank in Reading. Although Mr. Leach had scarcely reached his majority when Germany continued its ruthless submarine warfare, he sensed that the time had come for America to do her part. For months, he had desired to cross the seas to fight the Germans. Declining to wait for America actually to formally enter the war, he left his position at the bank and went abroad, joining an American ambulance unit serving in the French Army. He was the first Reading resident to go overseas to serve in the war. This conjures up images of the heroic and dashing character Frederick Henry from Heming Hemingway's novel A Farewell to Arms. While the fictional Lieutenant Henry drove ambulances in Italy, our true hero was assigned to Verdun in France. Those high school students here who actually studied the war might know that Verdun was one of the bloodiest battles in the annals of recorded human history. In a few short months, there were nearly 750,000 casualties on both sides. He spent most of his six months in the ambulance service in Verdun. Once as he was returning to a hospital with a wounded soldier, a piece of German shell passed through the ambulance, putting it out of commission. Despite the fire, he saw that the wounded man reached a relief station nearby. In a letter he sent home shortly after this experience, he said that war was worse than he had believed it could possibly be. But he added in true American spirit that the men in his unit were ready for anything, whatever that anything might be. If only the United States only comes and keeps coming until Germany is crushed and a secure lasting peace is assured. <laughs> Describing an attack, he said, the French guns were warming up for the final rounds of preparations for the infantry attack and the sky was one continual glare. Every now and then, red liquid fire lit up the sky for miles. The sharp scream of smaller cannon, which were all about us and for miles back shooting over our heads, was broken every few seconds by the earth-shaking roar of the big cannon. It was a scene I could never forget. We plunged through the dark trenches and out into the road. There, we met some officers and they showed us the way. The first shell hole opening up in our path did not make us feel safe, but the officers kept us moving steadily along and we followed. Miraculously, he survived Verdun. When his tour of duty was over, he had the option of returning home to the United States. But by this time, America had formally entered the war and was in desperate need of pilots for its infant air force. Instead of returning to America to recuperate, he answered the call and entered the American Army's aviation instructional detachment. It took all of my willpower to pick aviation as my service branch after I'd seen a number of planes brought down in air fights and had seen the results close range, he said in a letter to a friend. But I figured that if anything was going to happen, it would happen just the same in one service or the other. At least one can feel here as though he was doing his part. He completed flight training in half the allotted time and was commissioned a lieutenant. 
On January 23, 1918, while training another pilot, the pair encountered 20 German planes at high altitude. They encircled and got beneath them. Notwithstanding these odds, Leach's nerve did not fail. He had no gun or weapon of defense, and his plane did not possess the speed to leave his pursuers behind. His life depended on his ability to outmaneuver the enemy planes, and that he did. With a skill probably never possessed by an aviator with so brief training, he got safely through the network of German planes. However, with no safe place to land, the wheels of the plane came down in mud and skidded. He was thrown from the plane against a stone wall and killed instantly. Ernest Leach was 22 years old. He was the first Reading casualty of the Great War. Efforts by his family to bring his remains home here to Laurel Hill were not successful. He's buried at an American military cemetery uh, in Lorraine province in France. How did Redding choose to honor Lieutenant Leach upon his death? Article 17 of the March 24, 1919 town meeting, it was voted to change the name of Mayall Park to Ernest Leach Park in honor of Ernest H. Le Leach, the first boy from Redding to make the supreme sacrifice in the German war. Those of you who live on the west side pass Leach Park every day. It's the park at the corner of Hopkins Street and Summer Ave, not far from where Ernest grew up. I'm sure this beautiful park, once we reclaim it from MWRA, will take on more significance as you learn about the hero for whom it's named. So how do we, a grateful town 100 years later, honor Ernest Leach and the thousands who came after him and the current cadre of brave men and women serving in fields afar today? First, we remember and tell these stories. Second, and no less important, we act. In one of his last letters home, he fully realized the seriousness of his undertaking. Yet he said, if I don't come back, please remember that I do this willingly and gladly. I feel that the cause, of, that the cause is worthy of me. That cause was freedom and democracy. All too often now, we're content to leave making key decisions to others. We don't participate to the full extent of our abilities. We become complacent. In our recent town election, we were ecstatic that turnout exceeded over 40%. But that also means that over half of us stayed home. Today, as 100 years ago, worldwide and national events impact our peaceful little village. This will also be the case 100 years from now. As idyllic as we hope our town life to be, we're not an island. But these events also shape and hone us and spur us to action. It did for Ernest Leach, and it does now for our current sons and daughters in uniform. For those of us too young or old to wear the uniform, or whose talents or interests lay elsewhere, how do we answer the call to duty? I believe we must put ourselves where we're needed, right here in town. Run for town meeting. Join a board or a commission. Be a coach. Mentor a child. Visit a shut-in. Write a check. Donate time. Do what you can to strengthen the institutions and the fabric of our democracy. Advocate for your beliefs. Disagree without being disagreeable. Pitch in. Engage. Show up. Ernest Leach left us a wonderful legacy of service over self. Let's all try our best to honor that legacy with our own service to the town and country we call home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. And now I invite Jill Mayberry, United States Air Force, to read the Roll Call of Honor. These are the veterans that have passed since last Memorial Day as of May 22, 2018. May they rest in peace and know that they are looking down on us now. Robert Allen, Everett Blaze Jr., Robert Brown, Charles Cullinane, Vincent Donald, William Dunham, Clarence Edson, Salvatore Fantasia, Robert Gilligan, James Hanwright, Edward Harnish, 
James Killam III, Edmund Knowles, Robert Croeck, Russell Lafave, Elmer Lincoln, Duncan McLeod, Louis Maffei, James Mallon, Alberto Maria, Francis Mayers, William McIntosh Jr., Robert Miller, Thomas O'Brien, Robert Parker, Harry Poshley, Bernard Pothier, Charles Powers, George Robeshaw, William Russell, Thomas Ryan, Diana Sant'Angelo, Rocco Scali, George Sewall, William Thompson, Edward Toland, Theodore Watson, John Weston, George Wetmore, Gerald Zerfis. Thank you, Jill. I'd also like to remember one of our Gold Star Mothers who we lost this past year. Evelyn Kroos passed September 19, 2017. She was the mother of Marine Lance Corporal Robert Kroos who was killed in Vietnam on July 15, 1966. Let us all please remember Evelyn and her family and all Gold Star families that have made the ultimate sacrifice. Thomas Fenley, VFW Post Commander, and Josh Gray, Vice Commander, will now place a wreath in remembrance of all our fallen heroes. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Gold Star Father and Army Captain Arthur McDonald. Arthur was assigned as a Signals Intelligence Analyst with the 7th Army Europe. He was deployed multiple times to Southeast Asia in the late 1960s. Arthur and his wife have been decades-long citizens of Burlington, raising their four, four children there to include the late Marine Lance Corporal Gregory McDonald. Gregory was killed in action June 25, 2003 in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Since Gregory's passing, Arthur has dedica dedicated countless hours of his time to raise awareness and funds to help families deal with the passing of fallen service members. He is a member of the Disabled American Veterans in the American Legion, ser serving meals regularly at both the VA hospital in Bedford and at the Veterans <coughs> Clinic in Lowell. Gold Star Father, Captain McDonald, we welcome you to Reading. Good, good morning. When did it all start? Was it 9-11? Was it the Gulf War? Vietnam? No, for most of them, they were too young. Whatever it was, the undeniable fact is they died for something they believed in. A belief still pure and meaningful, untainted by the passage of time or the bitterness of ulterior motives. Yet they all volunteered to protect what they believed in. For some, it was freedom. Freedom from the mundane existence of their life or protection of the freedom they believed in to be national pride. For others, as with Gregory, 
It was a more universal belief. Uh, peace in his lifetime, not just for the United States, but for the entire world. A freedom that has been beyond the grasp of mankind since the beginning of time. Yet each generation continues to believe that they can make a difference. For most, in a very small way, for others, their aspirations go beyond the normal scope of understanding. For Lance Corporal Gregory McDonnell, his peace was world peace. However, his path to this objective was hindered by his, his ability to make a significant contribution. Living in Washington, D.C. and attending the graduate program at American University, he had the opportunity to surround himself with fellow students who expressed the same philosophy and enjoyed the ability to demonstrate it in our national capital. As a graduate st student, Gregory aspired to join the diplomatic corps. His graduate studies reflected his belief that the path to world peace started in the Near East, and he wanted to be part of the movement. He majored in philosophy and Near East policy and thoroughly enjoyed most aspects of his academic understanding. However, he also felt that he needed something more to distinguish his effort from his fellow students. So he undertook the task of learning Arabic on his own. As the time went on, he also felt that the best entry to his career was through the Marine Corps. So many people in the diplomatic corps gained entry through a Marine Corps career. So at age 26, Greg joined the Marine Reserves. At boot camp, he realized that being a trained killer was not the most challenging aspect of this profession for him. Then he volunteered for a week on school to be an armored personnel carrier driver. He truly believed that driving Marines into combat was more fulfilling than killing one's enemy. Two months into the land invasion of Iraq, he called home at 2 a.m. You knew immediately something was wrong because the sound of his voice expects the tragedy. Daddy said, today they uncovered a mass grave of women and children. It is something I think I will never forget. We are over here looking for weapons of mass destruction. What I saw today meets this criteria. Further in the conversation, he said he, he now knew why he was in Iraq. He said, if I do make it home after this war, I know I'm coming back. Only next time I'll be living in an air-conditioned hotel. Six weeks later, we received the tragic news of his death. I remember other parts of that night in May. Gregory profoundly stated this war would go on for a long time. He believed then the war would be long and hard. He also believed he would not make it home alive. In his farewell letter written five months earlier, to his family reflects this fact. His letter read, to be read by all who are mentioned in my will, all who knew me, or by anyone who claimed to even care. To all who I have known and to all I have loved. If you are hearing these words, then my life is past. So be it. We all die. It's just a question of when and why. I have struggled for more than half my life to live free, to know freedom. I can say it. It is a goal I achieved and it is a goal that I ever sought and embraced. Freedom isn't a moment in life. It is life. It is something to be attained every day. It is something beautiful. I pray you will 
all seek to find. I can leave no more than what I have. I collected volumes of music, memories, letters, prose, fiction, philosophy, poetry, served perhaps only as a sort of guide to understanding my life, who I was and who I wanted to be. Some of you knew me, some of you thought you did. Some of you fall somewhere in between. Talk about me, exchange stories, and get to know each other because you knew me. Our friendship will live as you befriend each other. That I have died means that I have failed to achieve the one thing in life I truly long to give the world. Peace. The plight of human suffering consumed me and I dedicated much to trying to find the ideals that lead to humankind towards for all of it. It was a quest which was inextricably intertwined with my quest for freedom. If you know anything about me, you know that. Understand it and come to understand how the suffering of others tormented my soul. Then seek to honor my memory by trying to achieve what I could not. You do not need to try to reach the lofty heights I see for myself. Merely act where and with what you can. I can offer no compelling reason as to why here, except in the world's misery, sh should be evidence enough. We are all human, we are all the same, circumstances separate us. Know that for the grace of God, or whatever power, you are not the miserable fool you have chosen to ignore. Enough of that and on to farewell. My friends, live your life, seek out beauty, seize every day and suck the marrow out of life. Give every drop and savor it on your tongue. Life is to be lived, not regretted, not mourned, not wasted or spent on pursuing anything but itself, and an end for what we should, for what we chose to make it. I went to my grave having done that. No regrets in my wonderful memories. I, I truly t tasted the liquor never brewed and dared to disturb the universe. My life may have ended, but it ended free. Go do the same. When Gregory died on June 25th, 2003, we thought the war had ended. Yet for every Marine that died after that, the war continued to be part of our daily life. There was definitely something special about being part of a Marine family. Cards, letters, donations to charitable organizations, homemade quilts, marathons dedicated by special friends, notes left at his graveside, flowers on special occasions. All this reflect a country that does not forget. Professor Shannon French, a professor at the U.S. Naval Academy, wrote in the book, The Price of Peace. Gregory MacDonald did not love more war. Gregory was a soul moved by human suffering who dreamed of being a guardian to those unable to protect themselves. Lance Corporal Gregory MacDonald was a warrior who wanted peace by being a humanitarian, yet in the midst of the horrors of war. The eulogy I offer you here reflects the story of many a fallen hero in this tragic episode in our history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur. I now welcome Barry Berman for a presentation to Mr. McDonald. Mr. McDonald, will you join me? Thank you so much for sharing your son's wonderful life and service to his country. And thank you for sharing the stories and keeping that alive. This is a certificate of appreciation that the Reading Select Board um, made in your honor. In appreciation of your service to our country and your participation with the town of Reading on Memorial Day, as we remember all of those that have gone before us while protecting our freedoms, thank you for your commitment and dedication to helping families deal with the passing of fallen service members. Given on this 20th day, 8th day of May, 2018, by the Reading Select Board. Thank you. Thank you very much.
And I welcome Sarah Baki. Sarah attended Parker Middle School and now attends Essex Technical High School. She is the Project 351 Ambassador and will present the Governor's Memorial Day Proclamation. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a proclamation. Whereas while the nation was still recovering from the horrors of the Civil War, people in cities and towns across the country gathered to honor those Union and Confederate soldiers who had given their lives celebrating the first Decoration Day. And whereas after World War I, the nation came together again to honor those who had fallen in the service of their country. Renamed Memorial Day, the last Monday in May, is when people remember and honor the memory of all the men and women who fought and died in all American wars and conflicts. And whereas throughout the, our country's history, thousands of Massachusetts citizens have fought in wars and conflicts to defend our safety and way of life. And whereas their legacy of patriotism and dedication to country is an inspiration to all Americans. And whereas it is appropriate that all Massachusetts citizens remember the bravery of those who have gave their lives so that their sacrifices serve as a reminder of the cost of our freedom. Now, Therefore, I, Charles D. Baker, Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim May 28, 2018 to be Memorial Day. Thank you very much, Sarah. The Reading Memorial High School Band will now perform the battle hymn of the Republic, followed by taps. If you could please stand. That concludes our services here at Laurel Hill. Thank you all for attending and putting up with the weather. I'd like to thank all those who participated in today's ceremonies. Thank you to the amazing cemetery grounds crew who did a super job preparing the cemeteries for this occasion as they do year round. Thank you to Frank Driscoll, our soldier and sailor's graves officer in his small army 
of volunteers that carried out General Logan's orders and decorated over 2,200 graves in our four cemeteries. Well done. Thank you to the flower shop at Eric's for the kind donation of our new memorial wreath. Thank you to the Reading Select Board and Town Manager Robert Lolasher for their unwavering support of veterans throughout the year. At this time, well, as soon as I can get down to the Pleasant Street Center, there are two tribute walls on display. The Pleasant Street Center is located at 49 Pleasant Street. The post 9-11 traveling tribute wall, Faces of Remembrance, and the Massachusetts Vietnam Gold Star tribute wall. Artist Gina Johnson, the creator of the tribute walls, will be on hand. I invite you to please stop by until 3 o'clock today to view these displays to honor and remember those that have made the ultimate sacrifice. May God bless all those that have gone before us and all those currently serving to protect our freedom. Ceremonies will continue at Forest Glen Cemetery at 1045, Charles Lawn Cemetery at 1130, and Wood End Cemetery at 12 noon. Thank you all and be well. Good job, both of you. Nice job, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for your loss. Thank you for sacrificing. How you doing? We'll see you uh, at the other, see you the other cemeteries. That's right. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Good Thank you. 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 So, uh, 10.45. 10.45. We're doing an on-field uh, presentation. General Hammond, thank you for coming out. So sad. Keep our together. <laughs> hey, buddy. Great job.